This is the Burns Mausoleum in Dumfries. On the night of the 31st of March 1834, around 9pm, a group of six men led by a surgeon and a newspaper editor broke in there with a ladder and a dark lantern and stole the poet's skull. Then a few hours later, they returned it. Welcome to Scotland Unplugged, and the story of a poet, some questionable science, and a spot of light grave robbery. This is Robert Burns, Scotland's national bard, our most famous poet, maybe even our most famous person. Each year on the 25th of January, we celebrate Burns Night on his birthday by holding Burns suppers, reciting poetry, and eating haggis. The only other people who get their names on days round here are St Andrew and Jesus. And they're not even Scottish. Until fairly recently, I'd never really got the big deal with Burns. But whatever I think or thought, lots of people love him and his poems about offal and mice and women. Mainly women. Burns died young. He was 37. At the end of his life, he lived here in Dumfries. He was a farmer's son and had tried hard to follow in his father's footsteps, but he didn't have much luck. This is the house Burns was born in, in Alloway, near Ayr. He'd only been to school for a year, but he wrote poetry, initially to impress girls. In 1786, running out of options, he decided to see if he could make a go of it, and published poems chiefly in a Scottish dialect on the 31st of July. It was a big gamble, but it paid off, the collection was a hit. The recognition allowed Burns to travel to Edinburgh, where he made a big impact on the literary scene. He was happy to play up to the image of the farmer, reciting poetry in his boots rather than the silk stockings everyone else wore. He'd carry on writing and went on to produce songs as well. He still tried to make a go of farming, but it didn't work out. And in 1788, he asked some influential friends he'd made to get him a position as an exciseman a tax man, in the days where that meant carrying a gun and chasing smugglers. This is his gun, and these are his walking sticks. Inside was a three-edged blade, designed to leave a nasty wound. His new career led Burns to Dumfries. This is where he lived for the last three years of his life. In the months running up to his death, he'd been unable to keep working as an exciseman. He'd go to the Solway to bathe in the freezing water three times a day under doctor's orders, trying for any kind of cure. But he was eventually confined to his room in here. Meanwhile, in the next room, his wife was about to give birth to his 13th child. He'd never been in very good health as an adult, and some of his writing seems to show that he didn't think he'd reach old age. He wrote the poem A Bard's Epitaph when he was only 27. He died on the 25th of July 1796, probably of rheumatic heart disease, and he was buried on the same day his son, Maxwell Burns, was born. He undoubtedly liked to drink. He was a regular sight in the Globe Inn and in the theatre here. His obituary and subsequent biographies suggested his death was down to the demon drink, an idea that persists even today. But he held down a fairly demanding job and none of the notes from the doctor who attended him at the end of his life suggest his death was in any way drink-related. A crowd attended the funeral, and Burns was carried by the men of the Royal Dumfries Volunteers. Not everyone knows this, but he was actually a serving volunteer soldier. He was buried here behind me, in what's now a very busy corner of St Michael's Kirkyard. It's quite some place, this graveyard. Even if you compare it to somewhere like Greyfriars in Edinburgh or the Necropolis, there's a lot going on here. This is his original gravestone. At the time he died, it was all his wife, Jean Armour, could afford. But obviously these days, he's moved up in the world a bit. In 1813, a fundraising campaign was put in place to build this mausoleum. The campaign really took off, with money coming in from as far away as India and America. Walter Scott got involved, and George IV chipped in 50 guineas. There was a competition with 50 entries. The winner was a Thomas F. Hunt, a London architect, and you can see the London influence. You walk in here and the place itself is impressive, all red and free sandstone, and then you see this. You can't really miss it. 
Burns body was exhumed and placed here in September 1817 and from then on this became a place of pilgrimage. But you want to know about grave robbing? Grave robbery had been a big problem in recent years, leading a lot of cemeteries to have measures in place, mort safes, watchtowers and closed mausoleums. The main reason was the study of anatomy and the need to get hold of fresh corpses for dissection. That had become less of a problem with the Anatomy Act of 1832. But what if you were an exceptional specimen? Archibald Blacklock was a Dumfries surgeon, a man obsessed with phrenology. In 1814, Spursheim's theory of phrenology was first published in English, and it caught on. Spursheim had been a protege of Franz Joseph Gall, a German neuroanatomist and physiologist who cooked up the original theory. The, um science of phrenology had been around for a while. Like a lot of pseudoscience, the theory was simple and sounds like it makes some kind of sense. The idea was that areas or organs of the brain, between 27 and 35 of them, carried out certain purposes. The larger that area of your brain, the more biased you were towards that area of your personality. Phrenologists believed that the shape of the brain influenced the shape of the skull. By feeling someone's bumps, you could discern their personality. That led them to covet some prized skulls and a craze for trying to dig up the great and the good. These are life and death masks cast from real heads by phrenologists and on display in the National Portrait Gallery. We have everyone here from Burke and Hare to Benjamin Franklin, although his cast comes from a statue. This being Scotland, Burns was high on the list of coveted skulls. Naturally, they wanted to know what made Burns Burns. What was the secret sauce swimming around his cranium? The editor of the Dumfries Courier, John McDermott, was annoyed that they hadn't taken the chance to examine Burns' skull when he was exhumed in 1815. But Jean Armour, his widow, wouldn't allow it. I mean, fair enough. But when Jean died in 1834, they took their chance. They didn't ask Jean and Robert's son, which does look a bit suspicious. What happened next doesn't look like something they had consent for. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been here under cover of darkness. On the 31st of March, 1834, Archibald Blacklock led a group of five men, including John McDermott, into the mausoleum. The night before Jean Armour's funeral, McDermott claimed they met her brother, Robert, off the train, and that they asked him if they could take the bard's skull for phrenological study. The story goes that he reluctantly said yes, but reports might have been a bit biased. McDermott was the one writing them. They made their way here separately, arriving at 7pm, but when they got here it was too busy, so they left and came back at 9. One of them kept watch outside, while the others went in. They lifted the floor slabs and climbed down into the vault with their ladder and dark lantern. Andrew Crombie opened the coffin. James Bogey, who had been there when they originally exhumed Burns, confirmed it was the skull he'd seen then. Archibald Blacklock made an assessment of the skull, then explained what he thought was going on to the others. He later wrote that nothing could exceed the high state of preservation in which we found the bones of the cranium, or offer a fairer opportunity of supplying what has so long been desiderated by phrenologists a correct model of our immortal poet's head. Then they left. They likely took the skull to the workshop of James Fraser, who was a plasterer. There they met the chief magistrate, the dean of guild, and the rector of Dumfries Academy. Not your usual resurrectionists. They cleaned the skull and James Fraser took a plaster mould, all the better to feel the bard's bumps with. Then they returned the skull to the mausoleum and sent the cast to George Coombe, an Edinburgh lawyer who was so far down the phrenological rabbit hole, he'd set up Phrenological Journal, which was apparently the foremost phrenological publication of its day, and I thought Scotland Unplugged was niche. This is Coombe's own death mask. Coombe was like a dog with two tails and published the snappily titled Phrenological Development of Robert Burns from a cast on his skull moulded at Dumfries the 31st day of March 1834. Need to work on my lung capacity for all these titles. There are thought to be six models of the poet's skull around today, with the best being an original in the Anatomy Museum here in Edinburgh. 
This one's in the Writers' Museum, and maybe an original or a copy. Fundamentally, phrenologists believed in nature over nurture. If they could prove that Burns, the heaven-taught plowman with hardly any schooling, was just naturally a poet, they could prove their theory and also the value of phrenology. But when they looked, they were surprised to see that he had a very small organ of amativeness, the area they said was responsible for romantic passions. That doesn't really tally with Burns the Romantic Poet, and the phrenologists were embarrassed for him, and covered it up by saying he had very well-developed organs of adhesiveness, and was good at forming relationships. I mean, it sounds like they might have been a bit more embarrassed for themselves. Confirmation bias, anyone? Phrenology was eventually discredited, and when Archibald Blacklock died in 1875, he was buried just a few yards away. Funnily enough, no one's disturbed him. If you want to hear my favourite Burns poem and see where it all takes place, check out the link at the end. See you next time!